I'll introduce myself. I'm Rob Chigier. I'm the faculty in the Department of Biology at UMass Dartmouth. I study uh, pollinator systems, ecology, neuroecology, conservation. Um, today, I'm going with a small group. It should be more a question and an answer type thing, but um, I prepared a 20 minute talk uh, on uh, how you can help to conserve native plant pollinator systems and uh, why you should care about these systems. I'll start with a bit of introductory material and then uh, at the end of the talk, I have a handout um, that will summarize some of the key points that I was uh, that I'm going to cover in the talk today. So the first thing we need to cover is what exactly is a pollinator? Everybody, you know, I asked this question, what's a pollinator? I have yet to get a correct answer. Um, so there's a big difference between pollinators and flower visitors. So a wide variety of animals uh, visit flowers to feed on the nectar and pollen. They think of the nectar as their source of fuel, the pollen is a source of protein. If you're a bee, a bumblebee, for example, you can't live more than 24 hours without that source of fuel. Um, pollen is required for the bees to make new bees. So you can give them lots of nectar, they'll survive, they'll fly around, but if you don't give them pollen, they can't reproduce, uh, which is going to affect the population. Globally, there are about 200,000 of these species, only 1,000 of which are vertebrates, like the hummingbird, shown up here. So the vast majority of what we see on flowers are going to be insects, and they come up in a variety of shapes and sizes. Um, what I want to point out here is, you know, I show a single bumblebee, but there are 50 bumblebee species native to North America. Other bees, there are thousands of native bee species, uh, hundreds of butterfly species, and thousands of moth species. So, um, you know, we can't treat these animals, we can't treat all bumblebees the same, which is one of the points of my talk, and I'll get into that in a second. So you can imagine a field, like what's shown in the background, all these things in blue, these animals figure out which, which flowers offer the best, or the best, or the best sources of nectar pollen. They'll adjust their behavior accordingly. The point here is that there's a lot of competition, right? Nectar and pollen is a limited resource. You've got all these animals trying to feed. And so depending on how much floral resource is there, they're going to compete and uh, outcompete one another. And some may not get any food, and that's going to affect population. So we still are using the term flower visitor and foraging. If one of these animals happens to move um, from flower to flower, transferring pollen, and this is the key part of the definition in the process, as a consequence of that pollen transfer, this is fertilization and the production of seed and fruit. Then we switch the name, and only then do we switch the name from flower visitor to pollinator. So a lot of people define pollinator as an animal that transfers pollen, and that is, is um, incorrect to the point where you're missing the point of saving the pollinators. Um, and so it, you need that fertilization. And, and what this tells us then is that pollinator has nothing to do with the animal. It has nothing to do with saving the bees. It has to do with plants and plant reproduction. So pollinator is um, how plants help, or, or, sorry, a pollinator is an animal that helps a plant to reproduce. So it's not just about keeping bees happy, it's about keeping the plants happy through the bees' behavior. And we're gonna to start to think about both the, the plant and the bee or butterfly or whatever the active is the pollinator together, and so collectively we call those things pollination systems. For example, here we have a medium plant. Here's, uh, there are two bumblebee species. There's Bombus spermatis. There's Bombus aptus. Bombus spermatis goes into the flower, making contact with male and female reproductive structures, leading to fertilization. Our Bombus spermatis is a pollinator. Here we have Bombus aptus. And one of the tricks that it's evolved to compete against long time bees is a really short time because it bites holes um, in the flowers, tubular flowers, at the base where the nectar is, and robs the flower. Right. Notice the bees on the outside of the flower not making any contact with male and female reproductive structures. So even though it's on a flower, it's not a pollinator. In fact, you can think of our bombus aptus as a parasite because when it takes the nectar, our bombus fervorous comes looking for nectar and there's nothing there, it's going to avoid a medium plant. And that is going to, uh, that plant is going to incur reproductive costs. So I can have thousands of bombus aptus. A bombus aptus is a bumblebee species, the first bumblebee species on the endangered species list. It's the poster child for save the pollinators, yet on tubular flowers it doesn't act as a pollinator. It's a negative. The plant's actually trying to deter all this activists. So I can have thousands of activists and still have no pollinators in my system. Similarly, I can remove this plant and just be bombus fervidus and I'm saving the bees, but I have no pollination. I have no pollinator there. You can't call something a pollinator hoping it's going to pollinate in the future. You have to know that you have the plant there that it actually pollinates. 
right? Then you can say, and it's a pollinator of that plant. So a lot of people use the term pollinator plant, or pollinator garden, or pollinator this and that. And those terms are absolutely meaningless. Any flower, flowering plant that offers nectar and pollen that's, that's okay, half decent, it's good, something's gonna visit it and feed. That doesn't mean it's a pollinator, right? So we really need to think about things from the perspective of the plant. We're gonna see why that's important uh, in a minute. So the plant and all of its pollinators collectively, that's called the pollination system. And so plants are looking for different types of animals to pollinate them. Some are looking for small bees, some are looking for uh, large, small body bees, some are looking for large body bees, some are looking for hummingbirds, right? So this plant's hummingbird pollinated, the nectar's looking down here. Notice the plant's depositing the pollen on the floor of the hummingbird. Why? Because if it deposited on the wings, it would be a very efficient way for it to reproduce. It would lose all of its pollen or its male gametes. Um, our bumblebees certainly could visit, but the nectar's down here, they, they would be pollinators. And so this plant has evolved mechanisms to mature our bumblebees. Here, notice the, the pollen on the back of this bumblebee, or, or the pollen on this bumblebee is on the thorax. Why? Because it's very difficult for the bees to reach that spot to clean off the pollen. That way the plant maximizes transfer of, uh, of pollen. Here we have a highly specialized system. So here's a fly species and a plant species. It's a one-to-one. -one. The nectar is located off screen down here. This fly's tongue matches it. This fly's tongue is to about here. And uh, if we remove the plant, the fly goes extinct. If we remove the fly, the plant goes extinct. Right? Well, so systems vary in how specialized they are from a one-to-one -one up to, you know, the, the, some are, are, are um, able to be pollinated by a wide variety of animals. But nothing can be pollinated by everything. Similarly, no single bee species can visit all plants, right? There is specialization on both ends of things. Here we have uh, a butterfly, goes the pollen on the other of and it's probably around this transfer of pollen. So these systems are diverse. Now, why are they important? You've heard the term pollinator before. There's been a lot of focus on honeybees. So bees as pollinators, they're the most important pollinators. And we just learned that's not the case. The most important pollinator, you have to ask the plant, who you want as your pollinator, who's your pollinator? And that's the most important. It might be a fly, it might be a butterfly. So bees in those systems aren't needed, right? So in agriculture, we have the honeybee, which is non-native and is very important for agriculture, pollination in an agricultural context. It is absolutely not needed in, in the ecological context. In fact, it's a competitor and it's a negative negative to neutral. It's not a problem. There's no native plants that need honeybees for pollination. So right away, now we're separating agriculture from ecology. That is a big difference. And, you know, people, the public attention, um, you know, awareness of, of um, pollinators and their situation started with honeybee, uh, colony collapse disorder of honeybees in 2006-ish. And since that time, everything seems to be bee focused, honeybee focused, and agriculturally focused, which certainly is important. But the other side is equally important. Here, all those pollination systems I talked about, right? The, the, the butterfly, the fly pollination system, the pollination system, the bumpy, large bees, small bees, whatever. If you can imagine in agriculture, those bees are pollinating and we're eating the fruit, right? So, so we've got a handful of bees. One non-native and maybe 5% of native bees actually function as, as pollinators out of the many, many hundreds and thousands of species that are out there. They're pollinating a single plant, a handful of plants. They're not native plants. They may have been native plants at some point, but we selectively bred them away from that. And they're feeding one species, that's us, right? When we switch to ecology, we've got, as I said, thousands of species, right? That are, um, and all these different plants are producing different types of fruit, different types of seed, different, uh, providing shelter and nest sites for this trophic level, right? So the seeds that are produced are feeding birds and small, small mammals and they're feeding predatory birds. So everything is connected. As we start to erode our foundation, we're gonna to start to see less food here, we're gonna see these populations crash and our whole ecosystem is going to collapse. Massive reduction in biodiversity. So we wanna keep our diversity of these systems to support diversity of our ecosystem. Ecosystem, um, uh, healthy, diverse ecosystems are important for ecosystem services. These are things we get from nature for free, like um, carbon sequestration, water purification, all those come from diverse and uh, um, functioning, healthy ecosystems. And if we start to lose these connections, those services are going to be degraded, and eventually we're going to lose them, and there's going to be a significant price tag if we can replace them, right? So agriculture is certainly important, but this is equally important both for human health and well-being, and also financial. Right? Two sides, agricultural side gets a lot of attention, so I focus on the ecological side of things. 
So these systems globally are being degraded both from the animal side and the plant side. So here's some data for bumblebees. Um, before 2000 flu, uh, 2015 to 19, I went back to those same sites and collected data. You can see in many cases the um, yellow bars are going to blue bars. Butterflies, all the ones down here, are declining. And it's the same for our native plants, and, and not surprisingly, many of the native plants that are declining are pollinated by animals that are also declining. So the system's being degraded from both sides, not, not surprising. What most people don't know, right, so it's save the bees, I see bees on this plant, I must be doing a good thing, is that there, there are more species that are increasing or stable, that aren't being affected. So whatever we're doing to drive the extinction, local extinction of some, others are thriving. So we can't, we can't use a one-size-fits-all approach because we're going to help the common species that don't need help and we're completely neglecting the ones that do. And that's the problem. And that's what we're doing. Um, and and I'll, I'll show you exactly how we're doing that in a second. But be aware that here this tells us we need to think about things at the species level. We can't think about things as bees in general. So what I'm doing to fix the problem, there are a number of different factors contributing to the degradation, degradation of these systems. Habitat loss and modification is the main driver depending on where you are, it could be pesticides, climate change, uh, disease, so diseases are moving from honeybees to native bees, which is a problem. Um, but I'm going to focus more on, on habitat, in particular, um, the types of habitat that these animals need and the plants need, the conditions they need to complete their life cycle. Right? So if you're a butterfly, you need a host plant, and you also need, as an adult, you need that, that nectar source, that's your fuel, that you can dump those resources into eggs, and that helps your reproduction. Right. So if you could have the best looking butterfly garden on the planet, but if you don't have a host plant, you're not going to see butterfly diversity. You have to have both in the same area. They're not going to fly miles to visit your butterfly garden if you don't have their host plant. Right. So we want to keep those together. If you're a bee, right, now uh, most of them have emerged from hibernation in the winter, so you need a good place to hibernate, one that is, is protected so you don't get frozen to death. Uh, when you come out in the spring, you need good nesting sites, you need nectar and pollen, right? The fuel and the way to make new bees. And you need enough bees to, to find each other, males and females to reproduce, and then they need to find a place to overwinter to complete the cycle. So if the bees come out and they're healthy and they're, if we've removed all the, the, um, the nesting habitat, that population is done for. In a single season, you can have these bees, uh, the population disappear. Right? So we need, to, we need to help them grow. For plants, we need to know um, who are the pollinators, right? So if we have our plants, we're putting them in our backyards, native plants, but we don't have the pollinators there, then we're missing that match. And so we need to know in order to help the plant species in the plant, we need to know who are the pollinators, where are they, how can we get them back into an area where we've um, made them disappear, and uh, you know, how much do these plants depend on the seed bank, and there are a bunch of questions you can ask from the plant's perspective to keep that life cycle going. So I started to collect data um, looking at what the, the spe specifically focused on the species of conservation concern, the ones that need our help. What do they need to complete their life cycle? All right. And uh, so I, I do that, and my graduate students, we do that in the summer. Um, but in, in order to help data collection, I created the Ecology Citizen Science Project in 2015-2016. And I get you, citizen so scientists, to go out and take short videos and send them to me of bees interacting with flowers. So we started with bumblebees, we're now onto butterflies. And um, the importance of the video is that the video tells me the behavior. Are they collecting nectar or pollen? And if you get enough data, you can determine what these species like to feed on. What, what types of plants do they like for nectar? What types of plants do they like for, for pollen? And, um, and so to help, I'm sending a lot of um, videos in my inbox, blogging my inbox. So I teamed up with some faculty at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, Computer Science. And they, we created the web app, the Ecology web app, and now you can take your video, upload it, the app will help you ID the bee and the plant and the behavior, and then it gets sent to our database. And we have a bunch of visualization tools so we can look at the connections between these different species to figure out um, what they prefer and whether you have that in your yard. But I've got a handout for you. So I'm going to show you. So what we found, both through my primary research and through ecology, is that, not surprisingly, you know, I've been doing this for a while, I knew these preferences exist, they existed, but I just need data to show it, that for the most part, the bees are separated out based on their tongue length. Long tongue bees, which are the ones in trouble, are teamed up with tubular flowers. Short tongue bees like um, things like golden rod milkweed that don't have a long tube. 
And uh, what we notice though is within these size classes, there are uh, preferences where long tongue bees differ from other species. So here, Bob's figure, the ones that are of conservation concern are red. Notice that it's for bright vanilla. Um, here we've got acacians, right? That common eastern bumblebee. Bumblebees are down here. It loves white clover. And it's the only one that likes white clover. There are a few ternaries on white clover as well. But everybody, you know, no mow may, let's not mow. We've got all these, these white clover and dandelion, they're crappy resources. You're really not helping very much by doing that. It's much better to put in native plants that they actually like and then let your lawn go, and then you're actually helping something or put in some host plants. So that effort, although you know, I think it's well intended, is completely misguided. So what we were able to do, you'll notice on the previous slide, there's a lot of vegetable and clover, non-native plants, but who are the native partners? We want to reestablish those pollination systems. And so for the bee species up here, the long-term bees of conservation concern, I was able through you know, 20,000 data points to figure out that they really like these plant species for nectar. So you put them in, this one this is coming out of bloom, this one's coming into bloom, this is looking from the start of the season right through to the end, uh, what they like for nectar. And, and I have, again, I have a list of all these plants um, at the end. The one thing though, so why not give them vetch and red clover if they like it? And the answer to that question is, remember it's about nectar, so a good source of nectar, and also pollen to make new bees, you need a good source of pollen. So here are the plants, the native plants that they like, that, that pensamin that was shown in the previous slide, the paniculares that was the first one to bloom, St. John's wort. Looking at how much protein per milligram of pollen, look at how high the bars are here, compared to white clover, red clover, dandelion and vetch. Right. So they're not going, what, what happens in the, uh, for Bombus fervus is one of the target bumblebees, is it collects nectar passive, or pollen passively when it's collecting nectar. So it's all over vetch and red clover and using that pollen. Whereas if you had these species available, just by, um, you know, indirectly it'd be doing much better, we getting a better source of pollen, and they actually prefer these plant species. So again, this is moving from feeding the bees to reconnecting them to their native plant partners and keeping that system going. Uh, we, we saw the same thing, so I have a grad student in Monroe doing the same thing in butterflies and we're seeing the same thing. There are certain species of conservation concern that have certain preferences. So the common ringlet's one of those species. It, so we've, again, multiple sites across the state over a two year period looking at what they were visiting in terms of floral resources. This species prefers um, or avoids long tubular flowers, like uh, short to medium tube. On the other end, we'll get long dash, which is another species of conservation concern. It highly prefers tubular flowers, right? So if we're gonna create a, a garden to help target these species, we need a, a, a mix. This is what's missing for most gardens. And then the uh, Eastern Tiger Swallowtail is another one um, that uh, shows a preference for tubular flowers as well. So if you like those swallowtails, you need the host plant, and you should have tubular flowers. If you have a bunch of aster and goldenrod, it's, it's not gonna help. It's not gonna support the species. And as an addition, notice that this species is out in May. A lot of people have things that start blooming in July, August. There's so much diversity that you need to support right when the snow melts. It's completely missed in most of these, most of these gardens. So all these data um, went into my client list that I have available. It's also on my website, which is shown down here. 20,000 observations in here. You just have to go through and I'm working on an automated system where you can say, here are the soil conditions, sun, light conditions, give me some options through the season. I'm not there yet, but there's enough information on the handout and on my website for you to piece together something that would help you support um, the bees and butterflies at this point. And, um, you know, it, this list, it, it doesn't exclude the common species. What happens is people put in plants that the common species love, and they're excluding the target species, the species of conservation concern. These plants do both. They're hitting the species of conservation concern and there'll be common species on there as well. So you're able to get the, the diversity back into your backyard of conservation. Um, so that's, that's my approach, right? It makes sense. This is what's going on elsewhere, right? So here's a list from pollinator.org. I could put up Xerces, even native plant trust I could put up here. And notice right away, Bumblebees, diggerbees, this one-size-fits-all approach that I told you isn't going to work. I showed you, and you can go out and see it for yourself, don't believe me. They're, they have preferences, and different bees have different preferences, and same with butterflies. 
I said that we're trying to reconnect native plant partners. All of these are non-natives, right? So we look down the bumblebee list, catnip, all of these are good for common species and they're non-native. So I'm not connecting, I'm feeding the bees, I'm not restoring pollination systems and those important native pollination products to feed the birds. The birds don't like non-native plant seed. They don't want to nest in the, in the um, vegetative material for the most part. They co-evolved with the native plants, so we should be putting them in if we want to uh, restore native biodiversity. So that's you know my list. And now the first part of ecology was to get the data. Now we're in the implementation phase. So let's, I've got the list, does it work? Right? And I don't want you to believe me that it works. I want you to go out and get the skills that you need to see that it's actually working. Right? So you get the list, put in the plants, see what's there before you put in the plants and then see what shows up after you put in the plants so you can see you've made a difference. Right? And I think that a lot of it, people are given plant lists and they put them in saying, oh, I got a great bee plant list. I see bees all over it, but you've completely missed the target bee species that you want or butterflies or whatever it is. And I've surveyed all of these gardens from these other lists and they are completely excluding the species that need it. They're, they're, there's a lot of honeybees and common bees and common butterflies and wasps, but you're, they're completely missing the target. So anyway, what I did was I started to point these plants in the ground at the small scale. So here are the, all the plants. These are about a quarter of an acre of, uh, of an acre. I live in Framingham. Here's what's in my yard. You can see pensament, or this is um, prunella, a bunch of species from my list. And also at a larger scale. So this is great neck and sulfur, 40 acres. And we have a relatively small area here, but going through the 40 acres and identifying native plants and mowing around them, there are different strategies to maintain native plant diversity and restore these connections um, at a larger scale. This, it's the same idea. So what we did after we created these habitats, we looked to see what was there, and sure enough, within the first year, if it bloomed, the target species showed up on site. To put things in perspective, Breakneck Hill, 40 acres, I've gone an entire season without seeing a single target at Breakneck Hill. And as soon as the plants started blooming in that ecology, these are all pictures from the ecology at Breakneck. Here's Bob Asperger, one of the targets here. They showed up immediately. I have sites in dark, I have sites all over the place. My backyard, here's some pictures from my backyard. Bob's Canadian, one of the targets, showed up on the Cornella. There were some skippers, native skippers there as well. All right, so a lot of success with putting these plants in. It isn't just putting the plants in, it's removing. All right, here we've got purple loosestrike. This is Breakneck Hill, purple loosestrike area. Thousands and thousands of honeybees and the common Easter bumblebee. Lots of bees, lots of activity, right? Remember, it's not about abundance, it's about diversity. All a couple of things. What I didn't see were these target species because they don't like purple loosestrike, right? So we remove the purple loosestrike. Here's the ecology, put it in perspective. A relatively small area, huge change from just that small area. So you don't need to change 40 acres to make a difference. You can start small and, and start to expand. What we found then after the, the um, three years, third year after um, loose strike removal, is a, a population of minimalists, a native plant, large population started to grow. The first bee that was on the video was this one. This bee is the second target. So not only did I see more than one bee over a, a, during a survey period, I found both the targets on the same plant. Remember, for, I surveyed from May to October, I didn't see a single one. These plants come in and I saw two on the same plant, right? So uh, this stuff works as they say, but what happens is when you remove those invasives, right? Um, autumn olives start to come into bloom. I was oh, autumn olive, it's feeding the bees. No, maybe some honeybees, but you remove that autumn olive, and this is the native plant diversity that you get, then you're gonna to start to bring in the native diversity and, and you're gonna get those beneficial pollination crops. So to, to show you the success, before we put in and made the modifications at breakneck, there were about five bonus burgers per year, and there was a lot of variation, some years none, some years a little bit more. But over the last two years, we've been surveying, on average, we're, we're seeing 25 per year. So even if you have them on site, again, we're giving them better pollen, they can produce more bees, the population starts to go up. And we expect the numbers to increase, and not just at breakneck, but all of our sites. Finally, I talked earlier about the connections, right? The pollination products. And we're starting to see benefits um, for di uh, benefits uh, of increased biodiversity, native biodiversity at other levels, right? So here's um, Mama Sagan's pollinated uh, Sherry St. John's Fort at Breakneck Hill. Fast forward a few months, here's the same plant or similar plant, uh, Mama Seed. 
Here's a white-throated sparrow. It's a species of conservation concern feeding on the seeds, right? It likes to feed close to the ground. It needs cover, and it likes native seeds. And we're starting to see these uh, connections being restored. And finally, here's purple giant hyssop, another plant species that's supporting these uh, bee species of conservation concern and butterflies. All the activity you see are all birds. There's got to be 12, 15 birds feeding on the seeds. In, in that small area that I showed you up right now, and this uh, wasn't observed there previously. So we're, we're starting to see biodiversity at these different trophic, trophic levels um, being restored um, at these sites. So uh, with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your time, and I'm happy to take questions. Yes? So two questions, I'll ask the one, one at a time. Right? Sure. Is so um, familiar with the work of Doug Town. Yeah. And he's got Homegrown National Park, which is to try to get people to plant circle seeds. Yep. Mm -hmm. the park that are supposed to be used for the doctor. That's right. Mm -hmm. And that those seeds, the next one, like, they feed birds. Yes. And then insects are really what birds eat. And I think a lot of people don't know that, but it's from what you've just shown, um, you're showing that the birds are actually eating seeds. So could you just talk about the relative importance of like growing or the versus growing the so, so, so uh, Doug Tallman and I are doing the same thing. So, when, if you've seen the regular length of my talk, I bring in several connection points. So, Doug, what Doug's doing is he is looking at the larval stage and how that feeds birds, right? So, that larval stage is going to become an adult stage and it's going to need to feed in order for it to make more larvae to feed his birds. So, what I'm doing is putting, look, coming at it from another perspective, and that is plant pollinator systems where um, the pollination is providing nest sites for those birds that Doug Tom was talking about. It's providing host plants for a wide variety of butterflies and moths that then, you know, these birds are picky. Some will prefer, you know, different types of food and also seed-eating birds would benefit. Um, and so this is just rounding out what Doug is talking about. Um, native grasses are extremely important for as host plants. They bumblebees use them for nests. And uh, the birds love native grass seed over non-native grass seed, um, just like they love native seeds over non-native seeds, which again is what Doug Tommy um, talks about. The other thing is cultivars and native ours avoid like the plague and straight species because these animals don't like. When you change one thing, you lose quality very often. And Doug talks about that too in terms of leaf color and not uh, supporting um, butterflies as host plants. So that's how everything rounds out. So it, it's I'm looking at things in terms from the animal's perspective, their entire life cycle. So for butterflies, it's the host plants which are important. And in, in, in the regular version of the talk I give, I talk about willow, oak, and these, these things and how many of the target butterflies are being supported. And I think that you know all native plants are good, but if you're uh, if you want to conserve biodiversity, you need to target those things that are in decline, and most aren't targeting. Doug's hoping that you're going to get the, all of them because of the number, but very often they aren't preferring what everything else is doing. You have to really look at the species and say, okay, it likes this, so I'm going to put this in. So it's a more targeted approach. My second question is about Germany. Um, I was there last summer, and I noticed in uh, lavender and other uh, just flower shrubs, tons of bees. And it, it struck me as so unfamiliar. I haven't seen these videos. Just the bee activity right. is so unusual. Is there something about land use practices in Germany that maybe they're avoiding the use of um, some of the agrochemicals or things that are depressing the depressing bee populations? Right, so so this is where, and this is the main, one of the main points that I'm trying to make in this talk is that there's a huge difference between abundance and diversity. Yeah. And you need to know what those, like who those bees are. For the most part, they're probably honeybees. So I, I can go in, if you take mountain bees, I can see, I've seen thousands of bees on mountain. It's honeybees and natives. It's the, the ones that need it aren't, aren't present, right? So um, there's, I don't think the, the numbers here, depending on the plants and where they are, like loosestrife, you can go up to loosestrife and there are thousands and thousands of bees, but they're all the wrong bees. You don't want to help those bees. And, and certainly a non-native is, is just feeding the bees and it's not restoring their functional role as pollinators, which is what I'm focused on. So I think um, you need to, you know, next time you go to Germany, take a closer look at what's there. And if you've got a single plant that's supporting a lot of diversity, which a lot of the plants on my list actually do that just because they're native plants and they support a wide variety of not typically on these um, 
plantless for pollinators um, that you would tend to see the same thing, and you get the diversity. So you'd see a lot of abundance and diversity. You just need to take a closer look. And I have a handout that shows the different bumblebees, what they look like, or you can use the app. Um, you can even use um, the Seek app for my naturalist if you can get to just to see how much, how many different things. And if you don't want to know the species, just say, oh, that one's different from that one. I see 10 different things for sure. Versus, I still hold they're all the same. You see a lot of activity, but they're all the same. That will help to guide your, your choices. Yeah, yes. Um, I have tall trees in my mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, not many of the herbaceous plants that you show like shade. Yeah. So I was wondering, what is the system of pollinators for the fundamental plants or the assembly plants that are native to, to Massachusetts? Do they have so, so a special pollinators? Uh, no, the common species will do it. So, again, the, um, well, there are two answers, or two things I want to say. First of all, we don't know about pollination system for very most of, for most of the native plants that we have. Right. For whatever reason, there's a lot of taxonomy going on, there's no ecology, and there's certainly no pollination ecology going on. So I have a grad student that's looking at some of these plants, particularly the ones of conservation concern, to figure out what is the pollination system, who are the major pollinators, and how do they fit, fit together. Rhododendron is certainly important, um, but it's feeding common, not the species of, of conservation concern, as much as something like that particularis I showed you. In the spring, though, trees and shrubs are, are what they're feeding on. Right. So, and, and it's hard for me to survey, so that's why a lot of them aren't on the list because I'm not going to recommend something that I'm not sure is going to help those target species. Um, but I know willow does. So, willow, male willow with nectar and pollen is a major um, source. You'll see a ton of diversity on, on um, willow. And certainly, you know, there's beech plum and there's some other things in the spring. And even the rose family is a good source of pollen for the most part. Um, but I haven't put them on the list just because, um, and what I showed you there too, I have full shade. So Woodman is one that's great for full shade, full to park shade. So if you look at my list, I have lighting conditions, it, it, it'll be full shade and go down and definitely put something together with, with um, full shade or the conditions. Well, yes? about the willows so, when you go to a nursery, why don't they let you know which one is You should ask. If they don't know, you should probably go somewhere else. And the same thing with the cultivars. If they don't know if it's a cultivar, you should go somewhere else. Or if they say it doesn't matter, then you should go somewhere else. And, and you have to be careful because Native Plant Trust will sell you cultivars. Right? So, anything like Miss Man or anything with a name is a cultivar and you should avoid it or a hybrid. Um, anything that has is in quotes, okay. so it'll be Penstemon Digitalis or, or uh, Mismanage or whatever name they've okay. given it, that's a cultivar and it's been modified in some way and what happens is that the plant has to take resources from somewhere to make the flower bigger or whatever the change is, what happens is it takes it from nectar production often or it affects chemistry or it affects pollen quality and you're actually lowering the resource, even though it looks great. From the, you have to look at things from the perspective of the pollinator, right? From the animal that's visiting, and it alters it in a way that they'll just avoid. It. And I've been burned a few times, so you should ask. There, I can give you a list of places that know what they're doing, like that would be able to answer that question. Um, you know, um, and so just email me. I'm happy to share with you. Yes. Excellent question. So, so everything has changed over time through coevolution, right? And these changes can happen fairly quickly. And depending on how much genetic variation you have, they'll be able to respond. So, if you don't have genetic variation, when change happens, you'll die out. But if you have the variation, then you'll, you'll you could form a new connection, and that would be called local adaptation. So certainly, let's say red clover is dominant in an area, and there's a lot of genetic variation. There may be some those bees, the bee population there may have a, a, a particular affinity for red clover that evolved. So they so they know what to find in that area because there's been selection for them to find red clover. So that certainly can happen. Ha have I documented anything like that? No, but it's certainly possible. Yes. Uh, so, fascinating discussion. I see a lot of 
collaborate with your community groups. Yeah. Um, the sustainable less for all. How do community groups? How can community groups engage with either your research or uh, to? I mean, if we had a piece of land and stuff, how, yeah. how does somebody get on that list and get the benefits of this? Science. Excellent question. So I've got one of my collaborators here, Freddie Gillespie from Southboro, that was the first site I started. So basically what happens is you'll contact me and I'll come out to the site and talk to you about what you could do, look at the conditions and make some recommendations and then you'll put the plants in. So I'll do a survey and then you'll put some plants in and I'll come back and survey and then show you the results at the end and say, here's what you had, here's what you did, and here's what, now, what you have now and here are the targets that you have. Um, and so it's you know, if, if you have the, because I don't put the plants in myself, yeah. and, and but if you have um, people to do that, maintain the habitat, then I, I help to coordinate that. And then I do workshops to help to train people on site what these different bees look like, what the target butterflies look like, so that it's, it's you know, teaching you to fish instead of you know, giving you a fish type thing. Um, that's all part of what I do. And, and it's been successful. I know. Um, Freddie, so in these habitats, people are want the plants and they're hard to get. So they collect seeds from the habitats we created and they do a winter sow and they distribute the seeds to the community and they're putting them in their backyards. And guess what? They're seeing the same results that they um, are seeing the, on the conservation. So that's how you do it. Okay. Yes. I'm aware there's a, a part of the right now in the North Road that's um, part of this park. Um, a part of this park? A part of my project? I think so. Okay. Oh, yes, Garrett, yeah, definitely. So, so I understand that the idea is to pick a tree from the area so that it can be adapted. Um, right, or you get, hopefully, you adapt, like you can get um, some that are more likely to, to persist from other nurseries. Like there are a bunch of nurseries that now have plants that have multiple generations that you can get them from. But yes, that's the idea is that once we establish these populations, then you can take seed and they'll be more likely to establish them. Can I jump in, Mark? Uh, yes. Just for the Westboro folks, um, there's an effort starting here. Julia, who invited Dr. G here to this event, because she couldn't be here today. She's working with um, the DPW, the gardeners. She's trying to get a good I'm with Sustainable Westboro. And Sustainable. Julia is a volunteer. Right. right. So they've been in touch with me to help. They have plans for a garden going in, so um, there's some level of movement. I don't know how well organized it is yet. Yeah. So Dr. Chagir certainly will be helping you with that. Okay. So, and I would encourage you as well, if you're thinking, to go out to Breakneck or there's a garden walk so you can see some of these plants. A lot of it is people just aren't aware of, you know, if you're looking for the aesthetics, they, a lot of data plants, they are functioning and they also look great. People don't appreciate that. They think they need some exotic to color things up a little bit. Um, so this would show you, when you can see some of these bees, May 21st, they should be out, should be enough in bloom. At these sites, you can visit through the summer and just get some ideas um, and also see things in action. You'll be, I think you'll be shocked at the diversity that you see. And, and such a small area. When is that event? And where? May 21st, um, South Borough Library, from 1 to 2. That's a Sunday. So next Sunday? I'll leave this up here if you wanted to take a closer look. There's a concert, folk concerts are birth day, they've got rain out close, and then at um, noon to 1, and then at 1 to the it's a small garden, but it has all of the Dr. Gears plants, and then We'll just have a little look at some there, and then there's people coming to sell plants on this list also. From nurseries that's been used just native plants. So, so they'll have some plants in there before we purchase it. Right, just from this list. So I said blue stem there local. Blue uh, nursery is local, yeah. So Dragonfly Nursery, if you have a larger area, you need more plants. Um, there's Wing and a Prayer if you're in Western Mass. Um, there is a New England Wetland Plants, there's Northeast Pollinator Plants. There's a lot of different nurseries that have good, good native plants that are on my list. So if you ever have a problem getting a plant, let me know and I'll connect you to the right group. Yeah. Yes. From the 
lot of these creatures are a little elusive on documenting what you see. Yeah, so so you'd be surprised what a five second video can do. So I literally can pan so there's a breakneck this beach parks are here and there's just a cloud of bees. There are probably twenty bee species. So I took my phone out of high def mode and just went around and slowed it down frame by frame and you can zoom in. The bumblebees are pretty easy, so if you see one, it's, you're about to flip like on the ecology website you watch you do this, but if you know how you know how to take videos with your phone because each phone differs, but if you're a foot away and just for 10 seconds, you, then you can scrub it. And the, this, the app allows you to slow it down and scrub it, and you can get to the right angle to ID the thorax abdomen and head, which is what you need to do a proper ID and sex, like with a male or a female. So if you can get a video, don't take a photo, you will be frustrated. And if you send it to me, often I can't ID. Like, so I get them, and it's head on. And they're like, what is this? I'm like, I have no idea. I know it's humble, but that's about it. So, but if they, if you give me a five second video, I can ID it, I would say 99, 98% of the time. They, they're very stereotypical. They go in, they come out, they turn. And if you video that in five seconds, they'll be in every angle and you can ID them. And so the app lets you take stills to help you the ID and then you send it in and then I look at them and I bet everything that comes into the game. And it's the same with butterflies. Butterflies go to the iNaturalist. Friday and then I check it when it comes in. Because it has an interest. Yeah. What are your thoughts about the uh, Yeah, a big no. big no. Right, so it's better to put in things like um, Joe Pie weed, purple flag raspberry. Just like with the food, they like to nest different types of material. And what those bee hotels, it's very, I, I, I don't know if anyone's looking at the species, but you're missing the targets likely, and also disease is a big problem. So it's much better to put in the native plants, you've got the floral resource, don't cut things to the ground in the fall. Everybody loves the deadhead. Well, the deadheading, that's the seeds that the birds are looking to eat, right? You mow it to the ground, those are the nests, that, those are the bee nests, and some of them spent two years ago. So, so don't, if you need to cut it back, like at least leave a good amount, um, but preferably you just, let it go, let, leave, it, leave the leaves because that's the insulating layer. When those animals go into the ground, they get down to a certain point and we don't have as much snow cover as we used to. That, that leaf layer is providing the insulation. You remove it, the, the uh, temperature, cold temperatures can go down and that'll kill them off. And remember, they're, they're not coming back once you kill them. It's not like honeybees where you can go get a new one, right? They're done, the population's done and we have to figure out how we're gonna re-expand the population. So it's it's fairly common you know, for the for anything that's blocked.